Thank you, thank you, Denise. It's good to be here. I am a Holocaust survivor. I am the only one in my family that survived. My parents and my little sister that was six years old were all killed in Auschwitz. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later. I, and I had a brother that was a year and a half younger than I, were lucky enough to stay alive. Although he died six weeks before liberation. He was able to do it until six weeks before li liberation. But let me start you off with, I was born in Romania. In 1939, the Hungarians took the territory over. Actually, it was given to them by Hitler because they joined the Axis. The Axis consisted of Germany, Japan, Italy, and some of the smaller European countries. And Hungary was one of those countries. So Hitler took this part of Romania, where I was born, a place called Transylvania, and he gave it to the Hungarians. So we were occupied overnight by the Hungarians. As soon as they came in, we were rounded up. We, the Jewish people, were rounded up and put into ghettos. The ghettos, this particular ghetto we were put in, was an abandoned brick factory. It was an old, old building that at one time they used to use to manufacture bricks. But it was abandoned, so they put us in there. They put us in there, and we were only allowed to take with us whatever we could carry. Not by car, not by bus, not by truck or bicycle. Only what you could carry in your two hands. So you picked up whatever you could, and you took it with you. Now, when they said everybody, they meant everybody, young and old, healthy or sick. As a matter of fact, they went to the hospitals and they took people who were sick and actually dying in a hospital and took them out of the hospitals. They took out babies that were born that day or the day before and they brought them to the ghetto. Now, we stayed in the ghetto for about two weeks. They fed us once a day. The second week, the Hungarian gendarmes or police came in and lined us all up and they marched us to the railroad station. When we came to the railroad station, we faced the German SS. I'm sure you heard that name before. Those were Hitler's famous soldiers, the SS. And they had a railroad train right in front of us. This was a freight train, a train that carried cement, lumber, animals. It's one of these trains one of these that has a door in the front that you open up. So they took us and they made us climb into these cars. And if you couldn't climb on, they picked you up and tossed you into the car. Once these train cars were loaded, they gave each car a couple of buckets of water and about six loaves of bread. And they locked these gates and off we went. We traveled for four nights and three days on those few loaves of bread and the buckets of water. And we arrived in a place called Auschwitz. That is a, I'm sure that's a familiar name, Auschwitz. When we arrived in Auschwitz, we were lined up. Those of us that were still alive, one third died in the car. All the sick, the babies, remember now, we didn't have any food for three days, except that one loaf of bread that they gave us. Nothing else till we arrived. And there was no medicine for the sick. There were no milk formulas for the babies. So most of them died. 
just maybe one third that survived. My family survived, we all survived. We were in good health when we got on these trains, so we all survived. And so we lined up and we faced a man that's called the Angel of Dead, Dr. Joseph Mengele. That's a famous man. Dr. Joseph Mengele was a medical doctor. He was in charge of the selection. I'm using these words because this is what we used over there, so I'm using the same words. What he had as a selection. He stood in front of you. Here he was, a German officer, about six feet tall, all dressed up in leather jacket, leather pants, glove leathers, and he had a leather switch in his hand, and he made a selection. He pointed to the right, he pointed to the left. No question asked, he pointed, and you had to follow his directions. After we were separated, my brother and I were pointed to our left. My parents and my little sister were pointed to the right. That was the last time I ever saw my family. I never again saw them. They disappeared completely. Never. My brother and I were marched off in Birkenau, which is part of Auschwitz, and we put them into a cell, and we were there for about five days. After five days, they took us to the railroad station and they put us on a train. But this time, it was a regular train. A train that had benches in it. And we went to a place called Dachau, which is another concentration camp in Germany. Dachau was the first camp that Hitler built in Germany. And it was built for his political prisoners. If he didn't like somebody politically, they went to Dachau. So it was a huge camp. So they took us to Dachau. And here again, we were only there for about three days. From there, we went to a place called Landsberg. It's a city not far from Munich. Landsberg is the city that Hitler was imprisoned in 1930, and he wrote his book, Mein Kampf. That's his famous book that he wrote. He wrote it in that prison. So they had two camps outside the city of Landsberg. They had Landsberg, and they had another one called Kaufering. These were slave labor camps. Now let me just backtrack for a minute. I, while I was in Birkenau in this barrack, the second day, I went outside, and I looked around, and I saw a smoke rising from the ground in a terrible smell. It smelled like somebody was burning flesh, meat. A smoke, a burning smell. And I looked there, and I didn't know what was going on. And one of the guys walked by me, and I, I stopped him, I said, excuse me, He's, what do I smell? What do I see? He said to me, when did you get here? And I said, yesterday. He said, anybody else in your family? I said, my parents and my sister. He said, did they go to the left at the selection? I said, yes. He said, look up there, that's what you're smelling. They're burning them to death, and that's what you're smelling. And I didn't want to believe that. But the more I stood there and the more I looked, I started believing. And it was true, that's exactly what they did. Well, a, f a few days later, they as I said, we, they took us to Dachau. And from Dachau, they took us to the Landsberg. It was a slave labor camp. This was a small camp, maybe about 2,000 of us. We slept in aluminum barracks. These were round barracks, and they gave us each a hand towel and a blanket. And that was it. So they put us into these barracks. We slept on the floor. 
There was no mattress. There was no straw, just plain dirt on the floor. So my brother was with me. So we took one blanket and we laid it down on the ground. And the other blanket, we covered ourselves. And we slept in our clothes for two reasons. We were always cold, so we needed our clothes to keep us warm. And also, we were afraid somebody might steal like your clothes because you were personally responsible for your clothes. If you lost them, it was your fault. Not the person that took them, but your fault because you didn't keep them. So in the mornings, at 5 o'clock in the mornings, they would wake us up. And there was no problem getting up because we didn't go to shower or shave or wash up. We were ready to go. We lined up in the kitchen. And we each had a little aluminum bucket with a handle on it. We went up to the window. And they poured what they call black coffee in this bucket, and they gave us each a slice of bread, which we ate the bread immediately because we were hungry, and we drank the coffee, and that was our daily ration until we came back that night. Okay, let me stop and take you back to my family for a minute. Now, as I told you, we were separated. They went to the left, I went to the right. Now, what they did with them, which I found out a couple of days later, they marched them up to a building, to a huge building, and they made them take all their clothes off. They cut all their hair. Everybody's hair was cut. And they took all their jewelry, everything they had, rings, bracelets, necklaces, whatever you had, they take away from you. They took all your clothes, and they made them walk into this huge building that was there. And they told them all that they're going to have a shower, and they're going to give them the clothes on the other side of the building. Well, they went into these buildings. After they were full, they locked the doors on both sides. In the ceiling, they had, it looked like shower caps rows of shower caps. And when they looked up that, they thought they were showers. Once the buildings were closed, the SS went up, climbed up there, and they turned on the spigots. And it was cyclone B gas. Within two minutes, everybody was dead. Everybody that walked into that building was dead. Now, each building had these narrow railroad tracks. And these little trains would come into these buildings, and they would load the bodies on these railroad cars, and they would push them into a crematorium. And once they pushed all these cars in there, they would burn them to death. Now, if they had too many corpses to burn, they would go, would take them outside, and they would burn them on an open field. And what I smelled are those bodies burning. That's what I smelled. And this man told me that, and the reason I told you this little story is because this is exactly what happened. Just a few years ago, my wife and I went back there. And we went through this crematorium, we went to the gas chambers. We saw these buildings packed with hair, people's hair, mostly ladies' hair. We saw a big, huge building with clothes, with shoes. All the clothing they took away from all these people. They still have it there because today you have a museum in Auschwitz where people come there by the thousands from all over the world to see what's in there. So let me get back to, to, the, to my camp. So we went to work, and the way we worked is we lined up in front of a gate. And outside of the gate, there were trucks parked. The trucks belonged to contractors. If a contractor needed 200 people to work for him that day, for instance, 
he was constructing a building or he was working on the highway and he needed 200 people to work, he would come there in the morning and request 200 people. Said they would count 200 people and they would go off with his contractor. And then at night, the contractor would bring him back and he would write the check to the German military. So many mark a day per head. So they paid for our labor. They paid for our labor to the German, the German government. I spent a lot of time working at a airplane factory called Messerschmitt. I'm sure you, everybody hear that name. They manufactured the Stuka. The Stuka was an attack plane that they used mostly in Russia. So I was assigned. So in the morning, you never knew where you were going until you got to the gate and they assigned you. So I worked there for a few weeks at this Messerschmitt factory. Now, I didn't build any airplanes. They didn't trust us with that. But we did carry cement. We, we built runways to test the planes. And we did all sorts of work, but not building airplanes. So this is what I did. Then another a few months, weeks later, <clears throat> I would be assigned to, uh, we were building some houses. There was an officer who put up some apartment houses outside the city, and we helped them build these houses. Well, we carried the mortar, we carried the brick, we built the highway. You never knew where you were working. At, at one time, I was assigned to a, what they called a Zonderkommando, which is a division that we went from block to block collecting the people that died overnight. Or people that were dying and they couldn't get up in the morning. They were considered dead. Anybody that was still alive but could not get up, he was too weak, was considered dead. As a matter of fact, my brother died this way. One morning, we were going out to work, and he said to me, and this happened February the 4th, 1945, and I was liberated May the 2nd, 1945. Three months, two months before we were liberated. He told me he couldn't get up, and I told him, you must. He said, I can't move, I'm paralyzed. And I grabbed him, and he said, I can't do it. And he just fell down again. So I laid him down. He knew what's going to happen, and I knew what's going to happen. So we had, in our camp, we had a little building that was called a hospital. They had a room with my eight beds in this building, and it was for show. For show, every two months, the Swiss Red Cross would come on an inspection because the Germans claimed that they treated us real well. We give them plenty to eat, they have good places to sleep, and they're, they're doing fine. We have showers for them, they're doing fine. We don't kill anybody, they're all doing fine. So they knew when the Swiss came because they were told in advance. So what did they do? They grabbed eight prisoners and laid them down on these beds. And they each covered with a blanket and they told them to lay there all day till after the inspection. And if they do that, they will be rewarded with a good meal. Well, everybody was looking forward to that because we wanted a good meal. Well, the Swiss Red Cross would come in and they would walk around and they would talk to us but they always had an escort with them so that we couldn't talk. So they asked us, how are you doing? And we said, fine, because the SS guy would look right, right into your eyes. In other words, he was trying to tell us, you better be careful what you got to say. So we told them, we're doing fine. 
and he would say, do you get enough to eat? And we'd say, yes, yes, fine. Well, they were there for a couple hours, and they left. They got those 10 guys out of there, and they gave them a good meal. And this little hospital had a doctor that they kept, again, for show. And I knew the doctor from back home. He was a Jewish doctor that I knew when I was a kid. So I went to see him. And he saw me coming into the room. He said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to go. I said, doctor, it's my brother. He said, what's the matter? He knew both of us from back home. I told him, and he just looked at me, and he said, I don't even have an aspirin to give you. I have nothing. Not one aspirin. We have not, you know, that's a show. You know they're doing it for the Swiss. Of course I knew. He says, but, but I'll tell you what. You go to work and just go to work. This evening when you come back, come and see me. I said, okay. I went off to work, came back the following evening, and I went to the little hospital, and he was standing right there, and he looked at me. And I just looked at him. I didn't even ask him what happened. I just looked at him, because I didn't see him in the room. And he said, he's better off than he was. Do not ask me any questions. And I didn't. And I knew what he meant. Either he helped him die, or he died on his own. I do not know. Even so today, I still don't know. But I do know he disappeared. He was gone forever. OK, that, so this was early spring. And as a matter of fact, uh, I would say they had every day at least 50 to 100 people who were still alive. And they picked them up, but they were too sick to go to work, and they were too sick, and they were considered dead, and they took them to the crematoriums as if they were dead. Just like that. Human lives didn't, didn't mean anything. One day in 1944, we in the Jewish religion, have a holiday called Yom Kippur. It's a day of atonement. We go to our temples, we fast from sundown to sundown, and then we go to our temples, we ask God and, and humanity for forgiveness. So, so this was 1944, Yom Kippur. We line up in the morning for our coffee and bread. Well. I was not religious. I was not going to fast because I fast enough every day. I'm not going to fast. So as soon as they gave me the slice of bread, I ate it and I drank my coffee. But in front of me, there was a man. I was, only, I was 20 years old. I was 19 years old at that time. The man in front of me must have been in his 50s or 60s. And he took the bread and he put it in his pocket. In the coffee, he poured out. And there was an SS guard on the left-hand side. And he came in, and he pointed his gun at his chest. And he said, why did you not eat your bread? He said, I'm, well, it's a holiday, and I'm, and I'm Jewish. I'm going to fast today, and I'm going to eat it tonight after sundown. He said, I'm ordering you to eat your bread. He said, no, sir, I'm sorry. I cannot do it. My religion says not to do it. Now you see, to me it didn't make any difference. I ate it because I was hungry. But to him it did make a big difference. This man believed in his God and he kept up with his religious beliefs. And he came and grabbed him by his collar and pulled him out of the line. And we went off to work. That evening when we came home, at the main gate, we had a big gate, and there was an arch on the gate, and it said, Arbeit macht frei. Otherwise, work will make you free. It was written in German on this arch. But on both sides, they had gallows. 
on the right and on the left. The poor man was hanging on a gallow with a sign underneath it, this is what happens to you if you disobey the German might. The guy paid, paid with his life for that. And I'll give you one other example. We, I told you, they gave us each a towel, a hand towel. And we were told to wear the hand towel on your on neck, like a shawl. And you never put it any other place, because they wanted to have control. When you came in at night, they wanted to see it on your neck. Fine, we did it, but there was a father and son in this camp. The, the son might have been 14, 15 years old, but he was tall. Therefore, he didn't go to the chambers. He came to work because of his size. You see, the, at the selection, they didn't ask you how old you are. They just looked at you. And if you're physically strong enough, then you're OK to work. So this little boy was with his father. And that evening, they both came in, and they did not have their towel around their neck. They looked at them, and they asked him where the towels were. And the father said, it was very cold. It, it was January. He said, my son doesn't have any socks. So what I did is I cut up the towels and made socks. I wrapped his feet and put them in the shoes. And now he's able to walk. He wasn't able to walk barefooted. He said, don't you know you're not allowed to do that? He said, yes, sir, but I'm sorry. He's a young boy, and, and I just had to do it. So they pulled him out a line. The following evening, we came home. Son and father were hanging on the gallows. Now, these were the people that told the Swiss people that how well they treat us. There was not one night that we came home that somebody was not hanging on the callous, absolutely for no reason. You have to be so careful what you say and the way you behave because you never knew how quickly they put you up. Or there were situations whereby they would shoot you. They didn't want to hang you. They turn you around, they shoot you in the back of their head. And I've seen many of them down like that. For, for, for almost no reason at all, for dropping something on the floor. Beyond belief what these people did. Well, anyway, the Americans kept coming closer and closer. So did the Russians. The Russians came on the Eastern Front, and the Americans, the French, and the British came on the Western Front. And the, well, the Americans were the closest to us. It was so close that we used to hear them fly over us, and they would drop bombs, and we could see the bombs coming down. Fortunately, we didn't get hit, but the bombs kept coming down. So, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a story. Uh, yesterday, I was also in a very similar place and spoke to a bunch of people like that, and one of the boys, said, that, tell us the story about the, the backpack, the rucksack. Oh, I was at the school in Birmingham, Shades Valley High School. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I spoke there. And this boy knew about, he wrote about it, so he knew about it. Well, so I was working for Master Smith at this time. I was working on a runway. Suddenly, the Americans flew over, and the minute the Americans appeared, we had a siren that went off with seven short, deep, 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 seven times. If it was seven, that meant run for cover. But that didn't mean us. That meant our guards, not us. We were not allowed to look for cover. So what we did is we laid down on the ground, look up, and we kept waving at them and begging them to drop the bombs, even though we may pay a price for it, but so be it. We just begged them, drop the bomb, bomb the bombs. And they came so low at times that I'm sure we could look up and see people in the, in the cockpits that low. Well, this day, while we're working, suddenly 
seven short beeps go off in the SS ran for cover. They had air raid shelters dug in the ground like cellars and they would run in there and then when it's over they had three short beep 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 that meant it's over. Well as I said we were not allowed to run for so we lay down on the ground and just looked up. So when after they left us, the guards left us, there we saw a room in front of us, about 15 feet. And this is where the guards used to keep their luncheons. So they each had a backpack, or a rucksack, as the Germans call it. And in this backpack, they kept their luncheons. And on the wall, they had a board, and there were nails nailed onto the board, and they would hang their backpacks until lunch. And then at lunch, they would come, they had tables, come in and eat. Well, it was almost lunch, and they were in their air raid shelters. And we ran over to the little room, and we each grabbed a backpack. And there was a lake there, and we ran down to the lake, and I opened my backpack, and there was a loaf of bread, black pumpernickel bread in a, in a piece of salami, or wurschen as they call it. I took out a salami, I ate a whole salami, <laughs> and the whole loaf of bread. And then I could have eaten more because we were, you can't imagine how hungry we, we were constantly hungry. We ate out of garbage cans. I ate out of garbage cans behind buildings. I went to the buildings and looked for the, for the Stuff that was laying there for a week, we ate it. Hey, how can you do that? You die, so what? I'm going to die anyway. So we ate. As a matter of fact, people want to know how come I survived. Uh, that garbage had a lot to do with it. Because I wouldn't give in. I simply would not. I was too stubborn. My wife said I survived because I'm stubborn. <laughs> so maybe so. But anyway, so we ate up and we took rocks and we filled up these backpacks and tossed them in the lake. We wanted the backpacks to disappear in the water so they couldn't find them. Well, the air raid shelter is over with and we go back to work and then we line up. And we were going back with trucks. We climbed up on these trucks. As we line up, suddenly one of the SS commanders he says, Achtung, Achtung, which is attention, attention. He says, those of you that took our backpacks and ate our lunch, step out. You got 30 seconds to step out. If you don't, we're going to count to 10, and then we'll, we'll count to 10 again, and every 10th we shoot. We're going to down the line. And we shoot, so we said, okay, so he says, one more time, step out. But we didn't. Because had we stepped out, they would have shot us. No, no question about it. And if they count to 10, maybe there's a possibility we survive. So while he was arguing back and forth, suddenly a motorcycle arrived. And an officer got off the motorcycle and he says to the guy, what are you doing? So he says, sir, they ate our luncheons today, and I was going to let them pay with their lives. He said, don't you know that the camps are closing at 6 o'clock, and you, they won't be able to get in tonight? What are you going to do with all these people? Where are you going to put them overnight? He says, get them on the trucks. He says, yeah, but I got to punish them. He says, get them on the trucks. Well, we, we survived. Nothing happened to us. We weren't punished. We got back on the trucks, and they took us off. But these are, the, 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 these are just some of the episodes, I'll tell you. Well, getting back to spring of 1945, the Americans got closer and closer. Well, one day, they line us, line us up and put us on trucks and take us to Dachau, back to the main camp. And when we arrived there, there were about 2,000 of us. They tell us to divide in two groups. 
those of you that feel healthy, go to the right, and those of you that don't feel so well, go to the left. Well, that created a problem. We knew that they had something in mind. Now, is it better to be healthy or is it better to be sick? We couldn't decide which way to go. <laughs> because we, we then decided, what the hell, they're going to kill us, the Americans are coming close, they're going to kill us before the Americans get here. Why don't we play healthy? And I'm talking about our friends, the young boys, my age. We discussed it and we decided to be healthy. So we walked over to the left, healthy side. And the other, the older people, the people that didn't feel so well, moved over to the right. Well, why, within a half an hour, they, they, they lined us up and they opened the gates and they marched us out. We went on a dead march. Now the dead march, before we walked out the gate, they handed each a shovel. And they told us, they made a little speech, they told us we're going to the Tyrolean mountains, which is between Germany and Switzerland, Italy. So if we're going there to build trenches for the German army, in other words, we dig deep trenches so the American tanks cannot advance. Now some of you know, may know the French had what they called the Maginot Line. That was a line built alongside the border between France and Germany. They built these deep trenches so the Germans could not advance. However, the Germans outfoxed them because they went around them. They didn't try to go across. They went to Holland. They went just around them. So they bypassed them. So the Germans was going to make us, 2,000 of us, build deep trenches so the tanks as they advance, will fall into these trenches and they'll stop the Americans from coming. Well, we never got there, but this is where we were heading. Now, we, wa we walked at night and we rested in the day. We walked at night because they didn't wear, at that time, the French were also getting closer. Real close, as a matter of fact, closer. This is the Gauls army, the Free French. They were getting closer to us, and they didn't want the French or the Americans to see us. And also, they didn't want the people in the villages to see us. We were all wearing these uniforms, blue and white stripes, and we all looked like we were half dead, which we were. So we walked at night, and we rested in the day. In the daytime, we rested in open fields whereby they had fields where they planted corn and they planted cabbage, onions, carrots. They planted all sorts of vegetables. And this being March, we dug in there and all the stuff that was not collected, we ate raw, just take it out without washing the stuff. We just ate it because we had nothing to eat. And also at night while we were walking during villages, we went into the behind the houses and opened up the trash cans and took the stuff out of the trash cans and ate it. So a few days later, we walked by maybe about 40, 50 miles. Suddenly we noticed where some of the German guards would discard their uniforms and discard their arms. They would toss them into ditches and they would pull out civilian clothes and dress in civilian clothes. They did not want to be captured in a German military uniform. They wanted to be captured in civilian clothes and tell the Americans, I was not a soldier, I'm a civilian, hoping to get away with it. When, when we saw that, we realized that the Americans must be next door. Well, one night while we were marching, I, I decided to take a chance and get away. It was dark at night and it was snowing. And I looked over to my right and I saw a light about half a mile away. On a field, there was a light. 
and I determined there was a house. There's a light, there's got to be a house, or somebody's got to be there. And I just took off. I knew there was a possibility to be shot, but I took off anyway. And I walked up to that house, and I knocked on the door, and the door opened up, and a little boy, a five-year-old old kid, opened the door. When he saw me, he's scr screaming, Mommy, Mommy, he called his mother. I scared them, but you can imagine the shape I was in. Filthy, I haven't had a shower in weeks. My, my hair was all over me, and so on, and I scared them. So his mother came out, and she looked at me and she said, who are you? I told her I was a political prisoner. And she said, what country? And I said, Hungary. She said, well, come on in which surprised me. And I said, all I really want is just if you give me something to eat, and I'll leave, I'll get out of here. She said, no, 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 come on and sit down. I sat down, and she, she went to the door and locked it with a key. And I said, you, you know, I'll have to leave because they're gonna catch me here. She said, they won't. I won't let them catch me. And I said, okay, I sat down. And she brought out food, and I started eating. And I became sick while I was eating. I had, I started throwing up, and I had diarrhea. And I kept eating. There was no end how much I ate. While I was eating, a German officer walked in. And I looked at him, and I recognized that he was a Wehrmacht. Wehrmacht is the regular army. Not the SS, the regular army. It's like the Marines and the GIs and the soldiers. Just a different army. And he went like this, he says, don't be afraid because I jumped, I scared me. He says, I won't hurt you. And I just kept looking at him, he says, I'm telling you, I will not hurt you. And I said, okay, thank you. And as a matter of fact, he sat down next to me. And I kept on eating, and he asked me who I was, where I come from, where, where am I going? And I told him the story that we're going to dig ditches. And he just shook his head. He says, are they ever going to learn, talking about Hitler, about his own people? Were they ever going to learn? And I said, we're supposed to build ditches. He just went like this. He said, Americans are next door. Well, he was stationed in this city. The city was a place called Bad Tilts. It was a resort city in the, in the mountains in Tyrolium. Beautiful, beautiful city. It's in the mountains, very beautiful. It's a resort area. This lady that took me in, her name was Smith. She was married. Her husband was an officer on the Eastern Front fighting against the Russians. This officer was stationed in this city, Batos. He was in charge of a warehouse, of, of a German military warehouse, and he was stationed there. He was, and he was her boyfriend. So he sat down and he talked to me. He said, Don't, we'll not let you out here. You're safe. Well, a few minutes later, there's a knock on the door. And he walks up to the door and he wants to know who it is. And the guy says, SS, and he tells him who he is. He said, what do you want? He said, I'm looking for prisoners. <coughs> for who? Prisoners. We don't have any prisoners. He says, I want to come in. He said, you're not coming in here. You're not coming in here. So the guy moved on. Well, they took me and they put me in a tub. They scrubbed me, they gave me a bath, and they put me to sleep, and they kept me there for three days. The third day, I was still in bed, the lady came in, and she said, there's some people here that want to see you. I said, Frau Smith, please. He said, uh, -uh. you're going to want to see these people. I said, please. He says, no, come on. I wouldn't do it to you, come on. So I got dressed, I walked out there, and I saw three soldiers, but they were not German. I couldn't tell whether they were English or French, 
or Americans, I just couldn't tell. They came over to me and they wanted to know what language I speak. Well, I didn't speak English, but Ms. Smith, she spoke English. So she says to me in German, he wants to know what languages you speak. And I said, well, I, I, I speak German, I speak Hungarian, I, I speak Romanian, I understand a little Polish, a little Russian, and I speak Jewish. He said, okay, just a minute. He went outside and he came back with another guy. And the other guy looked, he had a different uniform and he had some gold bars up here. I could tell by looking at him that he was a higher up because these other guys had stripes on their arm. This guy had a gold bars. And he comes over to me and he says, they tell me that you speak Jewish. I said, yes, I do. He said, speak to me. And I said, well, what do you want me to tell you? He says, anything you want, but speak in Jewish. So I said, I said, well, how are you in Jewish? He said, yes, he does speak Jewish, and he wanted to know where I was from. I told him from Hungary. He told me that he was from Brooklyn, New York, and he cannot stay, he's got to move on, because he's in charge of a platoon or something, and they got to, the Germans haven't surrendered yet, and we're chasing them, but the war will be over in a few days. And he says, your war is over. He says, I'll make arrangements. They're going to take you to a hospital, to a military hospital, which they did. They had a hospital in the city, which was a German military hospital. But they got all the Germans out of there, and they put those of us that were sick, and most of us were, in there. So I was there for a few weeks. From there, I went to another hospital in Munich. And then from Munich, I went to a city called Passau, which is on the Danube between Austria and Germany. And I went to school there. And that was 1946. I applied for a visa, American visa. In 1948, they called me and they told me my visa has been approved, that I can go to America. And they wanted to know how I'm going to pay for my trip. And I said, I don't have a penny. But I know some organizations that I can call who probably will help me. There were some Jewish organizations. that They were high, highest in uh, American joint. There were some organizations. And he said, would you work on the boat? And I said, yes. So I was assigned to work in the kitchen. This was a military transport ship, which transported military back and forth. So they had a kitchen down on the bottom, and I worked there for eight days, came to New York, and I had some cousins in New York that came to the States many years ago. And they picked me up at, a, at Ellis Island. Ellis Island is a place where all newcomers to America come to Ellis Island. And they picked me up there, and as a matter of fact, they took me for two weeks vacation in the Catskills. <laughs> well, some people might know where the Catskills are. And I had the time of my life. I've never been to a place like that. It's nothing but restaurants and nightclubs and swimming pools. I mean, it's heaven. They kept me there for two weeks. I put on some weight. I weighed 80 pounds when I was liberated, six one tall. The day I was liberated, there were a soldier said to me, I want you to remove all your clothes. And I said, what? He said, take all your clothes off. I want to take a picture, and I want to send it back to my family. I want my family in America to see what shape you people are in. I took my clothes off, and the, a bunch of, bunch of soldiers came with cameras and took pictures. Today, my, ca my picture hangs in who knows <laughs> whose living room. In somebody's living room to got my picture hanging there. Well, I came to America. I started off in New York. From there I went to Denver, Colorado for a couple of years. From there I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico. These are all beautiful places. The company I was with kept transferring me. And then they sent me to Birmingham. 
I met my wife here in 1960. And today we have three children, six grandchildren. And uh, here I am doing what I have to do. Because I feel like people must know what happened. So that you never allow this to happen again, ever. I, I, I can do a better job. You, you, you are adult people. But when I talk to a 15 year old, or a 12 year old, or to 18 year old, I try to emphasize how important this is not to allow it to ever happen. Because you'll have people, maybe even among you here, that says, it wouldn't happen in America. Oh, no, no, it'll never happen here. But let me tell you something. Don't you say that to me. Because, let me tell you a little story. When this happened in Germany, my parents, I suggested we leave. And my parents said, why? Because it's going to happen here. They said, ah, not here, never. Not here, never, it'll never happen. Well, those people that left survived. My parents that wouldn't leave never made it. So I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but by golly, it can happen. And look what's happening all over the world today, in Africa, in Asia. Look, what, look what's happening in the Arab countries. They're killing each other. So anything can happen. Just please don't let it happen. And again, it can. Well, with this, if you have any questions, have I got any time? Yes, you do. I just I want to point out, it, when you look at the exhibit, this picture Mitzi painted of when he opened, knocked on the door, and there's the little boy when he opened the door. So that's why I'm saying about this exhibit that Mitzi and Becky were able to take the stories that you heard. This picture right here is when he heard, he smelled the fire, and she took that story that he told you and made it into this picture. And then, like I said, Becky took uh, pictures of Max, uh, Max and his family and things. So please read these, but know that each one of these panels, when you see a picture, it has a story with it, just like Max told you. Um, okay, have you got any time to? Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Do you still communicate with Ms. Smith and her family, or did you see them after? I tell you, that, that's a picture that haunts me. The answer is no, and that was a big mistake. At that time, I didn't do it because I was afraid to do it. I was afraid to go back because I believed that she was using me to the Americans. She was using me in a sense, if they come in and they find out that her husband is an SS officer on the Russian front, they might take it out on her. And I, I, I was aware of what's happening, and I was afraid that she's using me. I, at that moment, that's what went through my head. No, I never did go back. Today, by looking back at it, I should have, yes. Just, do you ever wonder if the little boy could answer the door? I mean, the what? Do you ever wonder who the little boy was? The little boy that answered the door? I mean, well, he, it was her little boy. His name was Peter because I asked him who he was, and it was, and she sat them down, she lectured them not to tell his friends. She was worried that he might tell his friends. And she, for the first two days, she wouldn't let him go out of the house. And today, by looking back at it, yes, I should have gone back, I should have, but I did. We make mistakes sometimes, big ones. And that, I think, was a very big mistake. One thing I wanna say, last year, in fact, a year ago this week, I was in Auschwitz with Max's son and Max's grandson, who had just gone for the very first time. You. And it was just my honor to be with them because they had heard these stories, but um, I was with his son and his grandson. Any other questions? Yes. I didn't why, hear it. Why, why did you suggest to your parents to leave? Why do you think you knew something that 
was going we, on. We knew what, what it was on the writing was on the wall. Look what it did to the German Jews. Look what they did to the Czechoslovakian Jews. Look what they did to the Polish Jews. They, they killed them all. And I saw it happening. I saw it coming to us. But they didn't. They were, they were very comfortable. And they didn't want to take over and go somewhere and, and put up new routes. They just didn't. And I was only 18 years old, and I was ready to move. No, I, they were not the only ones. None of my friends' parents would move. And they talked among themselves. And they said, it won't happen here. They won't do it. These are friends of ours we live among. Well, as long as we were there, we were OK. But then things turned. How did they ever get, get over the anger? Anger against what? Anger against what happened to you? And the people that I, I haven't gotten over that. No, no. I, I, I'll always, as long as I live, I'm going to be angry against those people. <coughs> and my kids will be angry against them because they, they see me too much, they hear me too much, they live through life with me. And, and no, no, no. Now, had you asked me, do, am I angry against uh, the German people? This generation, I have no problem with. No, I'm not. They were not responsible for their parents or grandparents. Now, I'll tell you a little cool story. I, uh, I spoke at Maxwell Air Force Base. You are familiar with Maxwell in Montgomery. I had a call about three years ago from an officer, a general. He said, I understand that you do this. You talk about the Holocaust. I would love for you to come and speak to my officers. They have what they call an Air University in Montgomery, which is a military university where they bring officers from all over the world to Maxwell Air Force Base. And I said, no, I'd be glad to come. So I did, my wife and I went there, and they took us to a church, and suddenly the whole church was filled up, and I spoke to them, and it was over, they came and thanked me for coming, and I said, fine, that was it. A year later, I got a telephone call from the same officer, I think it was a lieutenant general. No, no, it was a one star, what was the major general? What? He said, Mr. Steinmetz, you spoke here last year. I want you to come back. I said, well, you already heard my story. He said, uh-uh. I want the foreign officers to listen to you. And we have officers from here all over the world. He said, and I want them to hear you. I said, OK. So I said, fine. Well, I told my wife about it, but she wanted to go. Then I told my son about it. He said, Dad, I want to go with you. Then his children, my grandsons, they wanted to go. Everybody wanted to go. I said, that's a problem. I got to call the base because they told me they're going to have my name at the gate. And they let me in. I called them up. And he said, sure, bring them, bring them. We did. We went down. And the place was packed with officers from all over the world. They had German officers. They had British officers. They had from South America. And they, al they also had Israeli officers, as a matter of fact. And before I spoke, they came up to me and told me. One said, my uncle was in the concentration. The other guy said, my father was in the they, they all had somebody. So after it was over with, the general asked me to stay there for a minute because some of the officers want to come over and say thank you. I said, sure. And they walked up to me, and I was up on the, on the, in front of the church. And they came up, and suddenly, the last person walking up on the aisle is a female. And she's crying. She had a handkerchief dabbing at her eyes, and she's crying. And I keep looking at her, and I can't can make out who she is. It's a uniform I'm not familiar with military uniform, and she's the only one, and she's sobbing, crying. As she got closer, I saw on her tag, it said, 
Deutsche Luftwaffe, German Air Force. Right here, she had a German Air Force. I said, well, that's a good one. So she came up, and I said, I, I, she said, she's sorry for what happened to us. And I said to her, I have a question. Did you hear any of this before? And she said, you are the first person that I ever heard from. I said, what about school? In other words, what about your parents? Not one word. We never discuss it. We never talk about it. You are the first person that ever told me this story. And she apologized. Then she wanted to know, do you hold any animosity? Do you, do you hate me? Because I'm, I said, no, I'm not. You're not responsible. Number one, you weren't even born but at that time. You're much too young for being responsible. And I said, what about your parents? She says, I don't know. What about your grandparents? And she said, I don't know. Now, did she tell me the truth? I don't know. I really don't know. Frankly, I doubt it that she went through school, through college, in the military, and she never heard that. I can hardly believe it, and I really don't. But at the same token, I spoke at Clay Chalkville, which is not far from Birmingham in a high school. And after it was over with, the kids came up to say hello. And the two boys, the two last boys came up to me, and they said, we are German exchange students. Well, I said, welcome. I said, I want to have a question. Did you guys ever hear the story? And they said, yes. Yes, very much so. I said, well, how did you hear that? And they said, we spent two years in Israel. They were there. They have some kind of deal going with the German government. But the young people, young teenagers, can work on the farms, what they call kibbutz. And they can work there for one or two years. And we were there, and we met many people who had the same experience that you had. And yes, we heard about it. And we are very, very sorry. But here again, I told them, it's not your fault, because you were 18, 19 years old. Anybody else? Any questions? Well, you were a good audience. <laughs>